Please welcome Paul Doherty to the stage. Well, hello, CES, and good afternoon. It's great to be with you here today. And I'm really excited to share with you our technology vision for 2024. There's a lot, of, a lot of research, a lot of work we put into this, uh, so I'm going to try to boil it all down and summarize it for you in about 40 minutes. And I'm going to do that with the help of some friends that will be coming out on stage. So you'll see me joined a little bit later by Fei Fei Li, Will Berry of Mars, and also Mary Hamilton of Accenture. And uh, together we're going to try to unpack what we see happening as the big trends for 2024 and beyond with technology. Now, like many of you, uh, hopefully you got a little bit of time away over the holidays, for those of you that, that celebrated the holidays, and reflected on everything that happened in the last year. And, uh, you know, what a year it's been with all the developments in the world, with everything that happened in technology, you know, generative AI, and all the, you know, all of the uh, new developments that we saw. I mean, it's only 14 months since ChatGPT hit the scene, and since then, think of all the new innovation and all the new possibilities that we, you know, that we uh, encountered over the last year. And uh, it's causing a lot of, I find, you know, a lot of uncertainty and confusion along with the, uh, along with the excitement. And uh, it brings to mind a song, uh, one of my favorite songs, by uh, Buffalo Springfield. And it goes something like this. There's something happening here, what it is ain't exactly clear. I'm not going to sing any more of it than that. But the, uh, that's what I find you know, captures the mood of technology at the moment. Something big is happening, but what is it? That's what we're going to try to unpack with the, with the vision this year and put a little focus around. Now, we've been doing this technology vision for over 20 years, and it's been a remarkably accurate forecast for the trends that are impacting business. And I hope you uh, find that this year as well. It was about 10 years ago where we made the statement that every business is a digital business. At the time, that was a controversial idea. You know, people didn't think of themselves as digital, but it quickly became really a truism and defined a generation of innovation and enterprises. A couple of years ago, we started talking about the fact that every business is becoming a technology business, and every CEO needed to become a technology CEO. Again, that was surprising at the time, but we're finding that to be the case more and more. Look at the number of CEOs presenting this week at CES as an example. And uh, we're going to come back more around that technology theme as I, as I really unpack this. And um, let's start with that. Let's get into the technology a little bit, what's happening with the technology. And you know, as, you've, as you all know, you're all uh, following technology closely if you're here at CES. Our, our industry, technology, and the, the work that we do moves in waves. And there's a series of waves that have defined the innovation that's come around technology. You can see some of the older waves have kind of stabilized a little bit, leveled off, and the newer waves are building fast. And there's a couple of things to take away from this that are relevant to today and what's happening. One of them is that in the past, a lot of the innovation was driven by consumer technology, but that's shifted over the years with more of the innovation being driven by business and by enterprise technology and enterprise spending. That's one shift you see here. Another shift that you see happening is the slope of the curves and how fast the technology takes off. And technologies that took you know, a couple decades to reach scale are now scaling up as fast as we've seen with generative AI with the investment curve that you see on the right side. I could have I used a dollar investment for generative AI. I could have used billions of parameters powering the models or a lot of other statistics. No matter what I plotted, it would have shown this massive increase in AI, in generative AI. And the other point around this is the platforms that then drive innovation. The PC and the internet came together to enable distributed computing and then global computing. Mobile and cloud came together to enable new business models and social, social media and social computing. And uh, AI, the question is, what platform is that going to create and what impact does that have on us? And that's what, what I'm going to talk through as I go through the presentation. Now, there's always a lot of skepticism with new technology. Uh, I got in the car. Uh, I got in the car to come to CES from the airport, to come to my hotel, and the cab driver said, are you going to CES? And I said, yeah, I'm going to CES. He said, tell me about AI. Is it going to be able to read my mind? Is it going to be, yeah, is it going to, be able to drive a car? What's it going to do? Everybody is talking about AI, and there's a lot of concern, as there always is with new technology, and you can see it's, it's always been the case, you know, that uh, you know, back in the printing press days, writing is going to create forgetfulness in, in the learner's souls. Electricity, death is lurks all around us, was the fear around electricity. 
the telephone is the instrument of the devil, was the initial uh, perception. You know, the internet's making us stupid. So there's always, with every new technology, there's the human reaction and the fear of technology. And we're seeing the same now. Now, it is a little different with AI because of some of the new questions raised. But, you know, the fundamental point is that as a society and as, a human, you know, as human beings, we work with the new technology and technology becomes our agent to drive capability and change. And that's why, against any measure, if you look at what's happened in terms of our, you know, the impact on society and humanity across all these technologies, it's been amazing progress that technology has driven in the positive for everything that's happened to us. And the question is now, how does that arc look, look like with generative AI and AI, and is it going to change? Now, to unpack that question, look at what's happening with AI. And this is an interesting chart because there's, there's no other technology on which you'd create an, a y-axis of human-like capability. That's what's different about AI. It's approximation of, of, a, of AI, of the technology reaching human-like capability. You wouldn't plot this for PCs. You wouldn't plot this for you know, the internet. You wouldn't plot this for packaged software for any other technology. And that ability of AI, and generative AI now in particular, to mimic and imitate human-like capability is the real power. And you can see it in, in terms of recognition, things like speech recognition, handwriting recognition, achieving you know, better than human-like capability. And then you can see it with other advances in comprehension and language, understanding NLP uh, much fast, much more rapidly, achieving human-level capability. And then with large language models and generative AI, another level of advances. And look at how steeply that's happening with approaching human-like capability. And that's really the difference of AI from any other technology you know, that, we've, uh, that we've seen before. And what that means is that you have to view AI uh, very differently than other technologies in terms of the impact that it'll have when you think about your business and you think about uh, what we're doing. And uh, the way to th think about it is AI is impacting what we do as, as individuals and what we do as businesses at a higher level in the stack than any other technology before it. Yes, you have to think up the stack at the level of human interaction, which is a very different way of thinking and a very different way of thinking about your business that we've thought about technology uh, previously, I would argue. And uh, it enables a dual effect where the technology is giving you know, people more human-like ability. You can interact in a more human way with the technology, which then enables more human potential and human capability. And that's to drive more productivity, which is what's often talked about with generative AI, more effectiveness in call centers, more effectiveness in, in other tasks using AI and generative AI. But it's also more creativity. And the creativity that we find, for example, in our Accenture song, our, our digital agency business, new, new innovative designs and campaigns that designers would have never thought of before that they can now do in a more personalized, uh, interactive, more creative way, leveraging generative AI and technology. So this is really creating this new, you know, new, uh, new era of human potential. And we find this in the way people are using the technology. From the research we've done as part of the vision, 80% of workers, 80% of workers are using generative AI in some way. Not necessarily at work, but workers are using and getting familiar with generative AI. Nine out of 10 executives are using generative AI in their work at least once, at least once, uh, once a week. And 95% of workers, of those workers using generative AI, believe this is a good thing for their career, which is pretty interesting. 95% of it believe it's a good thing, but a high percentage of them don't trust the organizations they're working for to make, you know, to make sure they get the right outcomes in their jobs and their career, which is the real potential that we have you know, to help lead you know, the workforce and lead our organizations through this that I'm going to come to in a minute here. What does that look like when you look at the enabling capability for business? You can see some examples on the page here. Uh, new, uh, new health outcomes and medical outcomes driven by uh, AI advances in remote surgery, robotic surgery, and other uh, types of procedures. In the middle left there, you see you know, new smart city innovations, places like Singapore driving new advances in sustainability and efficiency in the way the cities operate. The bottom left, new educational uh, modes, new ed educational vehicles that can be delivered in a very different way, different outcomes you know, through the technology. In the top right, you can see personalized fashion delivered in different ways, personalized you know, virtual fitting rooms in personalized fashion. Uh, so many, many different uh, outcomes that are really exciting that we're driving and that we're envisioning as we think to reimagine the future. But the question is, how do you get there? And now this is what we're talking about in our vision this year. And the title of our vision this year 
is human by design. Human by design. And that's a, uh, uh, let me unpack that a little bit because it may seem like, okay, you know, that's a, a different sort of phrase. Why is that a technology vision? It's two reasons. One is that by design, the technology is, gonna, is getting more human-like and will continue to. Generative AI will only gain more human-like capability. Other technologies that I'll explain in a, bit, in a, in a minute will only enhance the human-like capabilities of the technology. So technology is getting more human-like by design, and therefore, by design, we need to, in, in businesses and in organizations, use technology by design in a more human fashion to enable that human potential to come out. That's what we're really talking about. And the impact this has is profound. We believe this will lead to the reinvention of businesses. It's gonna impact every part of every business and touch every part of every business and um, really leads to the need for a different approach in terms of how you think about enabling your business. It's gonna, it's gonna redefine industry leaders. If you look back 20 years, only half of the Fortune 500 of 20 years ago are still around today. Of the top 10 companies 20 years ago, only one is still in the top 10 today. That's 20 years. I would argue we're gonna see that same disruption in less than 10 years as you look ahead to how, how this technology, human by design, is gonna reshape organizations. And then the final point I've already talked about is this unleashing of human potential. Now let me dive into how that happens. There's four trends underpinning the vision. And uh, in the, uh, the four trends you'll see pending up here, I'm gonna go through each of these really quickly, one by one, and then I'm gonna leave you to, uh, to, uh, to learn more as you explore the vision. I'll, I'll tell you how to do that, and then we'll then talk with some of, our, uh, some of the guests that I have here about what this all means. So let me talk about the first one, a match made in AI. This is talking about generative AI. And uh, we believe that 2023 has really been the year of, uh, yeah, 20, 2023 was really the year of uh, education and experimentation of generative AI. We've done about 500 generative AI projects for clients. So that's a lot of generative AI work. We had about 450 million of generative AI sales in our last quarter and growing really fast. So that's a lot of stuff, but it's been a lot of education and experimentation. And through that work we're doing, what we're seeing is that 2024 is shifting to be the year when, when companies really look to drive, uh, really look to drive the value at scale from the technology and how do they deliver real outcomes from the technology. And that's what we see happening with the match, you know, the match made in AIs, using AI in the way that I described earlier to create this human by design impact. But in the vision, we talk about three gaps that companies need to address to really achieve this outcome. There's a, there's a value gap, understanding how to drive the value of generative AI. A lot of organizations are just experimenting with use cases, point solutions, and what you really need to do is get beyond that to looking at how does generative AI impact entire processes, how does it really redefine the work that your organization does and drive that value? And that's the value gap that you need to address that we talk about in the vision. The second gap is the readiness gap, the readiness of your data, synthetic data, your real data, your third-party data. It's the readiness of your technology. Do you have technology that can integrate multiple models together? Because for any given process, any given part of your business, you'll likely need multiple models. Do you have the ability to future-proof and change models over time? That's the readiness you know, point. And then there's the responsibility gap along with the, other, along with the value gap and the readiness gap. The responsibility gap is the fact that you need to have responsible AI capabilities in place to manage the consequences, the bias, the intellectual property implications, the accuracy and hallucination. And while nine, while nine out of 10 organizations say they're concerned about the risks and they understand them, only one in 10 organizations are really putting in place systematic, structured, responsible AI processes to deal with it. So those are the three gaps we talk about in the vision that you need to really make the progress moving forward with, uh, with the AI. And that's what we see happening over the next year. Trend two then is uh, something I'm seeing more and more as I walk around CES. And it's interesting that all of these trends are very much in play here in Vegas. A match made in, uh, I'm sorry, Meet My Agent is talking about agents autonomously working together on a human behalf. What if you could have an agent that you charge to resolve a billing inquiry on your behalf? Well, this exists through companies like, uh, like, do, like uh, do Not Pay, which you can commission to look at your billings and subscriptions and uh, autonomously within parameters you set, work on your behalf. And there's an emerging class of agents working with agents that represents the next generation of how some of this you know, will unfold in the business environment. The third trend is the space we need. And uh, the way I'd subtitle this one is the metaverse is dead, long live the metaverse. 
I think a lot of people have assumed with generative AI that the metaverse sunk to the background. The reality is it's alive and well. Look at Apple's announcement today. Sony's announcement with Siemens last night on stage. The announcements from Samsung uh, that, they're, that they're coming out with. Uh, it's alive and well in many, you know, we've been working with many businesses on their metaverse solutions. You'll hear more about that uh, a little later. It's around digital twins, it's around manufacturing, often starting in the industrial sector, but also some in the consumer sector as we look to how this is playing out. And then the fourth trend is an exciting one, and I think it's a little bit further out, but it's our bodies electronic talking about how we, uh, about how technology is bridging the human to computer interface in new and different ways. This is eye tracking, haptic sensors, brain mesh, and other technology. We'll, we'll explore this a little bit uh, with, with one, of the, uh, one of my friends coming up on stage. And the question we're asking here is how does this enable new human capability? So, you know, like L'Oreal and what they announced last year with their hapta technology to allow those that are physically disabled to apply beauty uh, makeup and beauty care with the same precision as a fully healthy person using technology in different ways. Or the uh, hu uh, humane pin that uh, many of you may have seen, which is bringing a lot of the AI capability to bear in a single unobtrusive device where the technology completely disappears. With a humane pin, do you need, if that unfolds, do you need other devices? Do you need a PC? Do you need a phone? And that notion of technology disappearing is what's at the heart of, uh, of this fourth trend here. So I've talked about uh, you know, the, the vision. We've talked about a little bit about what, needs, what you need to do to enable it. This is really a summary of the gaps that I talked about earlier, building out the, the, you know, addressing the value gap, addressing the technology and readiness gaps that you have, and looking at new approaches to work and talent. And again, that's, the, that's what we unpack in this year's vision, Human by Design. So that's about as quick as I can run through it in about 16 minutes. Hopefully that gives you a taste of it and uh, causes you to want to learn a little bit more. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards about this uh, further as well. And the QR code will take you to some details. But what I want to do now, and what's uh, most exciting to me, is to bring some of my friends on stage to talk about this a little bit more and uh, talk about what human by design really means. So uh, to start with that first, I'd like to invite Fei Fei Li to join me on stage. Many of you, I'm sure, know Fei Fei Li. Hi, Paul. Hi, Fei Fei. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, Thank have you. a seat. Many of you, I'm sure, know Fei Fei. She was on this stage uh, just a few hours ago. Yep. And Fei Fei's written a, an amazing book called The World's I See, which I highly recommend uh, to all of you, and I, th I think was on the screen there a minute ago. And uh, you know, Fei Fei, you just had a, such an inspiring uh, impact on everything, and so connected to everything that's happening with your role at Stanford, founding the Institute for Human-Centered AI, your role with Google AI, uh, the ImageNet, amazing breakthroughs that that led to in, uh, in deep learning and more, and uh, one of my favorites, AI for All, that, you're, that you founded to bring AI, to, you know, equal opportunity and access to AI skills to everyone. So amazing uh, to see how you're connected to this in so many ways. And I thought a good way to start, since you wrote a book, uh, is people write books for reasons. So maybe talk a little bit about your journey on, on AI and in life and what led you to write The Worlds I See about where you see AI going. OK, first of all, thank you, Paul, for inviting me. And you say people write books for different reasons. I felt like I wrote the book under cohortion. <laughs> but uh, um, at the beginning of COVID, I did get an uh, invitation by a book agent to write a book about AI to the popular uh, public. And I was excited by that because I'm a technologist and also a, uh, an educator. And I believe this is such an important civilizational level technology that I would love for the public to hear more about it. I went back during the first year of COVID and uh, wrote, a, wrote a, a year, in a, wrote a draft about uh, the science of AI that, from my perspective, I give it to a philosopher friend at, uh, it's a bad idea, <laughs> at uh, Stanford, uh, who is a dear friend of mine, as well as uh, uh, the co-director of Stanford HAI, uh, John, Professor John H. Mindy. He read it, he called me to his backyard, social distancing, and said, Faith, it's no good, you have to rewrite. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> And he actually, I have to give him credit, he gave me a, a reason that I could not res uh, refuse, 
which is he said, I understand you're a scientist, I understand you're a technologist, I understand you wrote this book from a technologist perspective, but so many people are eager to get to know AI. So many people out there, especially the immigrants, the young students, the women, the people of all walks of life, it's hard for them to find a voice they can identify with yeah. as they learn about AI. And your own journey coming of age as a scientist from an immigrant in New Jersey all the way to you know where you are today, and that intertwinedness with AI's coming of age is a very interesting, unique story, and you should write it that way. So I literally rewrote the book <laughs> under coercion. And uh, uh, you know, as much as I'm a, a little embarrassed that this does carry a personal journey, I'm actually very uh, excited to share that with, uh, with the world because I think AI belongs to all of us, and it's important to see AI through that human perspective. Yeah, I think AI belongs to all of us is, is a great way to put it. And again, the, the way you write that the book and intertwine the stories is, is really special. And I really encourage everyone to read it. Uh, if you go back before the book, you wrote an op-ed, I think it was about six years ago in the New York Times. I think the title was uh, How to Make AI That's Good for People. And you talked about at the time, this is six years ago now, and this is about the fears and concerns and consequences and risks of AI then. Um, Maybe it's just, and I talked a little bit in my talk just about some of the fears that there's, they're still there around AI. Maybe talk a little bit about how, how have we done on addressing that and uh, what, what are the steps forward to both address the risks and address the public perceptions of, of AI? That's a great question, Paul. And uh, you know, you and I started talking about this also, you know, six, seven years ago about seeing AI as a, such a transformative technology and its human impact. Uh, I do feel we're still at the beginning of this journey. You know, as I said, AI is a civilizational technology that happens once in a while, not so often that humans invent a piece of tool that is so profound in changing who we are. And uh, our relationship as a species with tools has always been a messy one. You know, we tend to invent them because of a goodwill of discovery, of trying to do something, um, create something that's beneficial to our use, but along the way, they could become, you know, uh, uh, they could become weaponized. That there can be adversarial usage, there can be unintended consequences, and all of that is true to AI. So the journey. You know, the, the period between when I wrote the uh, op-ed in the early years of this AI revolution to today, I feel that the messiness had gotten more messy, but the awareness has gotten more aware. And I think we are still in the middle of that. So the, the societal economical uh, impact is even more profound. You know, look at yeah. ChatGPT, LLM, and its impact to creator economy, to, to just jobs and all that. In the meantime, the public awareness, the policy world awareness, the civil discourse, civil society discourse has also deepened. So it's a very interesting um, time and we, we need to continue to be so mindful and intentional about this. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel compared to six or seven years ago when you and I started talking about this, it felt like talking to a vacuum sometimes. The good <laughs> news is there's a lot of listeners, maybe too many, too many people listening at, at this point, which is good because there was a lot of people like, engaged and interested in taking the actions we need to take. Yeah, I think the inflection point of 2023 is not just technological, it's really public policy, is that because of large language model, we see the policy world worldwide woken up to this technology. I'm not saying that they woke up with all the best ideas yet, but, but it is important that it has woken up the, the public and the policy world. Okay, well, I'm gonna ask this next question with some risk because you can agree or disagree with me. But the- uh... What's more fun? <laughs> So you know, the title of, of the vision that I just talked to is Human by Design, and the point you know, we're making with this that you and I have talked about is, is that the technology will continue to be more human-like in its capability, and th therefore we have an obligation to by design, you know, be more human by design and to intent as we deploy the technology to make sure it has the right consequences. But with that approach, I, I'm optimistic that we can get to the right outcomes and we can solve new big societal challenges, do amazing things for our businesses and such with it. 
Uh, what do you think of that view, and is that consistent with your worldview? Well, Paul, really offline, you and I tend to agree a lot anyway, so it's been years like that. Of course I agree with you. I, I do think we need to be intentional. I do agree that humans should be put, it, be put in the center of this. It's not just designing our work, designing our life. It's really recognizing human dignity, human agency, as we bring this uh, technology to uh, uh, to, to, to the world. I do think there is a little bit of a nuance is that optimism doesn't necessarily mean pure tech utopia, techno utopia. Yeah. I think optimism recognizes the risks and the dangers. And I do, I'm sure you do too, that there are societal, potentially even catastrophic risks mm -hmm. that we need to be intentionally uh, recognizing and try to mitigate. I think the, the optimism that I would like to underscore is really the optimism in humans. People tend to ask me, do I have hope about uh, AI? Yeah. And my answer is also always, my hope is not in AI, my hope is in people. And it's people who come together who have this agency to create AI for the right thing, to govern AI for the right reason, to deploy AI for right purposes and applications that we can move the society forward. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And I, I often use the, the phrase that you know, technology is neutral. It's what we as people choose to do with it. So with intent and uh, human by design and optimism, I think that's, yes. that's how you get to the right, the right spots. A quick point on data. You know, you were, I mean, talk about, we, everybody talks about data being the key to AI and such, but I mean, you, you created ImageNet. <laughs> you were the, the source of really you know, understanding the impact of data and creating data that really drove advances in AI. Maybe talk about that experience and then uh, how are we doing on you know, creating the data that we need and understanding the data that's going to drive further advances in generative AI? Right, okay, the story of image is a bit of a long one. You can read my book. <laughs> that's the short version. Of course, it, it, it happened around 2006, 2007. It was the early years as an AI researcher that uh, my collaborators and I recognized the, the importance of, of data. In hindsight today, it's almost like a no-brainer. The relationship between data and AI algorithm together makes AI happen. But back then, it was a paradigm shift. You know, most people were not recognizing data was not a first class citizen. We were not using big data to drive AI. So, so creating this biggest uh, uh, AI data set called ImageNet and, and almost forcing the field to recognize the importance of data was part of the catalyst of deep learning revolution. Now, fast forward to, to today, 2024, I think that the technology world as well as the business world has a much better and nuanced and, and, and deeper understanding of data. First, we do recognize that with data is a treasure trove. It's a treasure trove of business opportunities. It's a tre treasure trove of the business analytical insights of what our customers want, what we can make our products better. We also recognize big data drives the technology in ways that continue to surprise us. We also recognize that data integrity is a much harder concept than we thought yeah. it would be. You know, the data integrity involves fairness in data, privacy concerns in data. Now in generative AI, we're seeing creator economies tension, the, the, the intellectual property, copyrights, and how we uh, deal with data. So data continue to play a deeper and deeper role in AI and the tension between the, the, the desire to use data, to benefit from data, to create a business moat with data with, with the, the dangers, the, 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 the limitations and the, the um, potential unintended adversarial impact of data. These two sides are, are constantly uh, in struggle, and we have to we have to recognize that. Yeah, no, it's that's uh, it's amazing, and again, they can read more in the book about uh, about all that. What well, final question? Just uh, maybe a short answer. So we gotta we gotta move on. But uh, what's something? You know, what do you what do you see ahead with AI that people might not be anticipating? What's something we should? This maybe you know something you see in the future that we're not focused on yet. 
So one thing I really want to point out that the whole AI chatter right now is focused on big tech AI. You know, a few companies and their big models and so on. One thing I would love to raise the public awareness and, and, and underscore how important it is, is public sector AI. Last June, I met with President Biden on behalf of Stanford HAI and shared with him that this is such a profound technology. It's so important for American leadership that America as a country should adopt a moonshot mentality to invest in public sector AI. It's only when America's public sector is healthy, the ecosystem altogether is healthy, especially that public sector AI shoulders the responsibility of deep knowledge discovery for good, for the public, as well as technological as, um, assessment and evaluation that is independent of for-profit driven motives. And this is one area that I'm excited by and I hope uh, everybody's more aware of. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Fei Fei. Thank That's you. Inspiring comments. Uh, yeah, thanks, Paul. And uh, a big round of thanks for joining us and uh, a, a, a recommendation for everybody to buy the world's I see and learn a lot thank more you. about Fei Fei's perspective. So thank you, Fei Fei. Thank you, Paul. And then I um, want to invite another friend uh, to come up and join me, uh, Will Beery uh, from Mars uh, Snacking, the CEO of Mars Snacking. Will, come out and join me. Come on, round of applause. Welcome for Will. Hey, no, Thanks Paul. for joining. Now, I've been Thanks up here a while. I'm getting a, little, I'm getting a little hungry, so I thought maybe we could share a, there you go. a, a snack. Good brand buddy. placement. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Will... Uh, yeah, it's Will, just for a little background on Will, he's CIO of Mars Snacking, uh, really a, a pioneer in, a, in a emerging technology and consumer goods in a lot of ways with what you've done with uh, you know, kind of uh, digital transformation, supply chain manufacturing, a lot of different ways you've applied it. So I thought I'd maybe start with, uh, with you with everything you've done and the journey that you've been on. Maybe talk about this human by design and the technology we're talking about. How do you view it up at Mars and where's Mars on the journey with this? Yeah, I think, um, Paul, journey is the right word, right? Because I think, as you said in your opening, we just don't know exactly where it's all going. But ours started quite a while ago. We were looking at um, spatial computing in the manufacturing plants, things like augmented reality, virtual reality for training purposes, maybe factory tours, things like that. A big right. gimmicky didn't really take hold. Yeah. All of a sudden, introduce a global pandemic where people can't travel, can't get into facilities, and that same technology is how we were starting up and shutting down factory lines so we could keep people and pets, you know, yeah. uh, getting to the products that they love. So that's where it began. Now, that might have been by luck, but digital twins were not, right? I saw the opportunity of taking IoT sensors, putting them across a physical manufacturing line, introducing edge compute, and then where could AI solve hard problems that are not new. They've been there forever, right? right? So we started with Skittles, um, and it was also during 2020, and it was, we were giving away a lot of Skittles, overfilling bags, overweighing product, um, when the lines would get out of balance. So that's where we began. How could AI you know, keep the lines in balance, inform the operators when they were getting close, and then with precision tell them how best to This is things like operate. visual computing and the like to yeah. balance out the packages, yeah. yeah. And you know, two years later, I like to say we're north of 100 digital twins globally um, across all sorts of products. Um, we've got Skittles, we've got cocoa processing and, and spray techniques for M&Ms, we've got gum sheeting precision for Wrigley gum products. So it's really just taken off, which has been fantastic. Um, where we're at right now, we're looking at, uh, well, we're not looking, we're actually deploying autonomous guided vehicles and cobots into warehouses, also into factories. That helps us offset our labor challenges, which everyone's um, yeah. somewhat going through in the industry. Yeah, right. um, and we're putting in a manufacturing data platform on our internal systems, which are old and all over the place, because that's the only way we're going to be able to harness generative AI inside the factories versus with external data. So this is where we're going. And I think my vision is our factories of the future will be able to bring all these together and as you say, human by design, really optimize our manufacturing processes. Well, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you, say, you talk about tomorrow, but what you're doing today is pretty amazing when you think about the digital twins, the AR in manufacturing, everything you're using, using AI to drive efficiency and productivity and better results is it's amazing today. If you think about the other side of your business now, 
Uh, and by the way, I like Skittles even more than m and so we'll talk about that later. But the, uh, the other side, you know, the consumer side of your business, these are such iconic brands, you know, Skittles and M&Ms. People love them. I'm sure everybody's got their favorite uh, brand in mind. How do you see uh, the human by design technology from a consumer you know, perspective in that part of your business? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a lot of the reason why myself and the leadership team are here this week, right? This is all about the consumer. And you had an M&M's pack there. I mean, if we just take M&M's fans, they're, they're one of our biggest brands, and they're one of the brands that consumers interact with the most, both digitally and also physically. If you think about our M&M's world, there's one right down the street, Disney experiences, right? So these same techniques we're now deploying towards the consumer. How do we meet an M&M's consumer wherever they are with what they want, when they want it, right? Using hyper-personalization, generative AI techniques to do that digitally. Mm -hmm but then even bring that experience into our physical stores and try to not have a, a different experience for the consumer. And then things like spatial productivity, optimization of our stores, computer image recognition can be used to optimize where we put products on the shelf, you know, where we refill M&M color walls, things like that. So these are real techniques that we're, we're actively scaling. It's yeah, pretty it's, exciting. It's amazing. I think it's a great illustration, too. I talked earlier about the idea of every company is becoming a technology company. I mean, technology is much of part of your business as it is for a lot of technology companies. It's interesting what you were saying earlier is that you've actually got your own space set up here with Mars and a lot of your people here because of the, the need to drive technology and innovation across the business. Yeah. yeah, and I think you said it best. I mean, Andrew Clark, who's our CEO, is with me this week as an example. You talked about CEOs yeah. all of a sudden having to embrace digital. I mean, that's what Andrew and I do. Our whole relationship is kind of together, two in the box. How does digital transform um, the Mars snacking brand so that they're a better consumer proposition? Well, fantastic. I think a great illustration of human by design. Thanks for joining us. Will. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah, right. Then the final, uh, final guest I'd like to invite to stage is Mary Hamilton. Mary's uh, one of my cohorts uh, with Accenture who drives a lot of our innovation. And, uh, Mary's always looking ahead at what's out there and what's next. I'm always excited uh, to hear Mary's perspective. And I thought, Mary, a great uh, thing for you to highlight for us would be the, the last trend we talked about, the body's electronic, Will got a little bit into some of those technologies just now, but why is this something we should think about today and maybe bring it to life for us a little bit? Yeah, so, so this trend is really all about dissolving the barriers between humans and technologies, right? So as we, as we think about how, we're, how the relationship between us and the technology we use is becoming more seamless, more intuitive, it's really helping us to not just struggle with technology, but to use it, right, to help it work for us, to amplify us. So I wanted to take an example, bring something to life here. Okay. Um, this is a Mendy headset. So when, when typically people think about brain-computer interfaces, um, it's a, you know, something maybe out of a sci-fi movie. Uh, maybe it's a research lab with wires. See all the wires in your head. head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I love as a researcher. Don't get me wrong. Um, but take a look at this, right? This is, it's just as simple as this, a very simple device. Um, and what this particular device is doing is measuring the blood flow in your brain. And it turns out we can get a lot of information from that understanding. Um, and, and with that information, uh, our research labs have actually built an application that combines the sensing from the Mendy headset along with generative AI capabilities so now we can start to help users see a personalized view of their focus, right? And, and ideally, if they use the interfa interface well and, and practice with it, it will help them improve their concentration and their focus over time. And so um, really when we, when we think about uh, this kind of technology, um, there, you know, if, we, if we can gather just from tapping into your blood flow how you improve concentration and usability around that. Imagine the, the troves of, of data all around us, all about us, that we can start to apply in new ways, right? And, and we can think about um, this, it's really a, a set of technologies that is leaning into meeting us on our terms, right? And, and being able to do that in a way um, where we don't have to learn new gestures or new interfaces, but it becomes seamless. Yeah, and it's interesting how, how things seem foreign initially, the mm -hmm. idea of putting on a headset and the idea of interpreting blood flow and brain and everything. I think, yeah. I think does intimidate people initially, but it, it's interesting how quickly things become accepted over time right. and, and truly the, to the point of unleashing human potential. Yeah. The, the example, the, the, the mind gym yes. example that you're building is all about, it's helping people 
increase their focus and be better. That's right. You know, be better at what they do, and that's uh, really, I think, a great, uh, great, a great uh, example of human by design. Yeah, it, it's not. It's not just you know improving technology's usability, but it's really giving insight and it's helping people improve themselves. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and thanks, Barry. That's fantastic. Yeah. So thanks for joining yeah, us thank and you. sharing that. Yeah. And, uh, All right, thank you. And I, I think that is a, a great, uh, a great illustration, and maybe a great way to wrap up as we as we uh, as we run out of time here. Hopefully, you've seen kind of a theme there about this human by design. And uh, the th idea I'd leave you with is that this is operating at a higher level than any other technology we dealt with, which means as businesses we need to take a different view of how we reinvent, how we reimagine what we do. And uh, as we do this, I think it is creating a whole new world of opportunity for us. The um, I'll move on to. Just remind you of what the trends were. If you could just bring the slide back up on the screen, uh, you know, to see the, the four trends that we talked about. Just pay attention as you go around CES. I think you're going to see some of these like generative AI all over the place. I think you'll see some like the body's electronic. You'll see the emerging potential of these for the future. And I really do believe this is the course that will, you know, will you know, di dictate the winners and losers as we look at the next iteration of business and those next iteration of leaders that will define what it means to be human by design. So with that, thank you. And uh, you've got a lot of information there. You've got cards on the tables in the back on what you can, uh, on how you can scan and get more. So thanks for your time today.